welcome. Today we will take a look into how to write low latency database applications, even if your code sucks. We will look into how the edge, and in particular data at the edge, can save you more on your latency budget than the mightiest performance optimizations. First, a bit more about myself. I spent the first 10 years of my career in the Linux kernel, working with things like virtualization, storage, file systems, and resource management. Later, I was the VP of field engineering at Scylla, a database company I bet you are familiar with. I am now the founder and CEO of Turso, an edge database company. I placed a premium on low latency my entire career, which is why most of my three kids were born slightly ahead of schedule. These days, when I'm not working, I am mostly taking care of them. All right, so let's get started. We will start by looking at how latency for database access is commonly measured. If you are measuring latency, you are probably comparing two systems. For fairness, you want to reduce the degrees of freedom of the system as much as possible. It is, after all, the scientific thing to do. That is especially true if you are publishing a benchmark. And even then, you get accused of all sorts of things. People are always looking for a way to say you've been unfair or you haven't set up the comparison properly, so on and so forth. So you tend to keep things as simple and isolated as possible. If you want to compare the latency between two database systems, you put the clients on a good network that is close to the database, keep your workload constant, compare, and write down your conclusions. The problem is, for a class of applications, this doesn't tell the whole story. If we exclude batch analytics, where throughput tends to matter more than latency anyway, and focus on the systems where there is a human user on the loop, the user will be physically somewhere. So let's zoom out to understand this a little bit better. For our hypothetical system, let's assume that your users in New York City are 10 kilometers away from your cloud backend. Now, I know our American friends in the audience, yes, you, the ones that got triggered by me mentioned the word kilometer, may be surprised, but there are other countries in the world. And no, I am not talking about Canada. Some of them are actually quite far away. Your users in Sydney, for example, will then be 16,000 kilometers away from the same backend. The real life impact of this realization is that if you spend months optimizing the loop, between your backend and the database, be it by improving the connection code or the database itself. You may reduce your P99 from 10 milliseconds to one millisecond. That is 10 times better and certainly a reason to be proud. But for comparison, the round trip between New York City and Sydney is 250 milliseconds, give or take. So you would have to excuse our Australian friend here if she doesn't care a bit about your latency improvements your effort just reduced the P99 from 260 milliseconds to 251 milliseconds, from impressive to barely noticeable. And that's not even considering the fact that those 250 milliseconds are not constant. They're just a reference number and will fluctuate per request. Barbie is not impressed. So what is the solution? Well, the best solution is to keep writing amazing code but put a copy of your database in Sydney. But let's be honest, we are always juggling tight schedules and tight deadlines. The cruel reality is that if you do nothing else but find a way to make sure that your database calls are 50 milliseconds away from Sydney, you are now saving yourself 200 milliseconds, way more than the 10 milliseconds you save with your mighty performance optimizations. Obviously, this example is extreme, but even between New York and San Francisco, latencies can be on the order of 70 milliseconds. As we can see on this table, New York City is also 70 milliseconds away from Amsterdam, 150 milliseconds away from Sao Paulo, and usually 180 milliseconds away from Tokyo. Unless, of course, you are using Rust Async with Tokyo in New York, in which case you get the responses pretty much immediately, but that doesn't count. And those are ping times. Do anything more complex like HTTP and those numbers go higher. Moving your backend code to the edge 
is how you provide every user, regardless of where they are, with a good experience. But what is the edge? Simply speaking, the edge is an abstraction that allows you to execute code in a variety of regions across the globe. How does it differ from simply putting a lot of VMs on different regions on your cloud provider? First, the edge tends to have a lot more regions, really looking for that extra mile latency. Cloudflare, for example, run their workers platforms in more than 300 locations across the globe. It really is like a CDN and the cloud had a child. Second, this is all abstracted away. Your code automatically runs in the location that is closest to your user without you having to worry about manually setting that up, routing or requests and anything of the sort. Location doesn't play a role at all when writing or configuring the application. A common misconception is that the edge is necessarily serverless, but that is not true. There are edge serverless providers like Cloudflare Workers, Vercel Edge, Netlify Edge, among others. But there are also edge providers that allow you to run VMs like Fly.io, Koyab, Unicraft, among others as well. But moving code is easy. Code waits nothing. For things like simple middleware that never access data and has no state, code at the edge is the final solution. For anything that access data, to really lower latencies, you need to make sure that both code and data are at the edge. But how? You are now convinced, at least I hope, that moving code and data closer to your users, to the edge, it's a good thing. But how do we do it? If you have per user data, you can partition it, such that data that belongs to a specific user is close to them and nowhere else. For global data, if you are expecting a magic algorithm or a magic solution, this is where I will unfortunately disappoint you. There is no magic. If you have global data that has to be accessed by a distributed user base, replication is the only way to achieve it. Replication, though, is not a novel idea. So why is it that we still have systems that penalize users far away? It boils down to cost. And the realization that plain old replication is what allows us to access global data is liberating because it allows us to reframe the problem in terms of cost. The question becomes how to build the cheapest possible database that can partition well and replicate to a lot of locations. Before we answer that question though, let's look into some facts and constraints of what we will want this database to look like. First of all, when I say a lot of locations, what is a lot? Edge providers run compute in a really mind-blowing amount of locations. So when I say a lot of locations, I am not talking about three, more like 30 and maybe even upwards of that. As we saw, edge providers can be present in hundreds of locations and why we don't need to replicate in every single one of them, good coverage is needed. So the cost model has to take this into account. We also observe that traffic tends to be seasonal. Yes, we want our database to be present everywhere, but it doesn't need to be active everywhere all the time. For most businesses, the bulk of traffic happens at certain hours of the day. When you have a database spread across the world, you can use that to your advantage and scale certain locations down when not needed. Lastly, let's look at the cost of the main components. Turns out, replicating data is not that expensive, at least not until you reach many terabytes of data. The numbers I am showing here vary from provider to provider, but the cost to start a gigabyte will hover around 10 cents a month per location. That is $100 per terabyte per month per location. That's hardly expensive. If your business is the kind of, especially if your business is the kind of business that has a terabyte of global data. For something like a huge product catalog with 10 gigabytes of data, that's really just a dollar a month per location. CPUs and memory is where it gets expensive. The cost to run a single CPU with some reasonable amount of memory from a quarter of a gig to half a gig is around $20 a month. So what we really need is a database that is small, nimble, fits everywhere, and scales to zero easily to take advantage of seasonality. And oh, of course, cherry on top if it's SQL. 
I'm deeply sorry for the Scylla folks. I love you all, but the truth is developers love SQL. If we had that, we could build replication around it and build our fast everywhere database. Now, is there a database today that fits the bill? Turns out there is SQLite. When we set ourselves on the task to build a database that works well from the edge, SQLite was almost perfect. The only problem was on the almost part. We would like to make some changes and contribute them back to the main project so that at least the building blocks of replication are natively supported and not bolted around the database. SQLite though, is not an open contribution project as per their own website. So pushing those changes was a tall ask. For full disclosure, we actually haven't tried it ourselves, but not only their website say so very explicitly, we have also found a long trail of previous attempts. And that's how we forked it into the LibSQL project. The LibSQL project is a fork of SQLite that is open contribution. As such, it has some changes that have nothing to do with just replication. But the most important changes for the purpose of this talk are two. First, write ahead log virtualization, so we can consume changes to the database as they happen and replicate them. And second, an HTTP-based protocol and server implementation. This is because a lot of the relevant edge providers these days are serverless, to the point people conflate the two. In those environments, you won't have access to a file system. Turso is our commercial offering based on LibSQL. So how does Turso handle replication? Using LibSQL write ahead log replication, we can achieve snapshot isolation with read your own writes passive replication. Your reads can be delayed, but will always respect the transaction boundary. And in the same connection, you will always wait for your own writes to get acknowledged. Writes on Turso are unfortunately potentially slow. Not only SQLite is infamously much better for reads than writes, but because the service needs to provide zero conf behavior for routing, you can always write to any replica. But for consistency, they will always get procs to a primary that is in a single location. But reads are replicated. When using serverless, you will be automatically routed to the closest serverless replica from a single URL without having to change any configuration at the application level. And new replicas will appear on the locations of your choosing in seconds. The service scales to zero and back up within hundreds of milliseconds, meaning we can take advantage of traffic seasonality to keep things affordable while still providing a fast experience. If you do have access to a file system, Turso runs well as well as an embedded database, same as SQLite, except our service will replicate the changes that other clients made to your service or device. As we discuss, partition and replication are the two ways to bring data close to your users. Per user data doesn't tend to be shared that often, then partition is the way to go there. Turso has a solution for this too. Since it is based on SQLite, every database is just a file. You can efficiently create tens of thousands of databases and easily have per user data. Then you can spread the data around close to the locations where your users are. So what does it look like? The graph in this slide is taken from Vercel's Edge benchmark tool that compare different databases being accessed from Vercel Edge environment. Each database was set up by the respective provider and each just provided a single HTTP endpoint to Vercel. The benchmark does five queries in a row, simulating data dependency, which is a typical experience when loading a web page. It is a more realistic workload than a single query, but under the hood, essentially what it's doing is that it is amplifying latency effects. The blue line in the benchmark shows the latency from the database's preferred location, which the benchmark defines as the closest location to the database. For our case, for example, which we will see in the next slide, our preferred location is the location where the writes are routed to. The purple line is the latency from the edge location, closest to the client. If the benchmark is run close to the database's preferred location, we would expect those lines to be very close to each other. But in this case, the client is in Brazil, 
or one of our engineers run the benchmark. And the database's preferred location is in the East Coast of the United States. This graph represents a setup with a serverless Postgres offering. The gap between the purple and blue lines is immense. And for this particular user, the latency for the whole experience is higher than two and a half seconds. Using Turso, the situation is much better. We have not only one, but two points of presence in Brazil. In total, there are 34 locations around the world, plus however many more you want if you run it inside your own server. For the same queries, the same workload, the latency now is below 100 milliseconds for the five queries. And once more, there is no magic. If we were to replicate the initial setup with Postgres, of course it would get much faster too. However, a setup with six locations with Turso, enough to cover every continent, costs only $29 a month. Plus, there is no need to change your application, either the code or configuration, to take advantage of that, since there is a single URL that handles that for you. In summary, moving your data close to your users will have much more impact on the end-to-end -end latency than most performance optimizations you can do at the backend or database level. There are really only two ways of doing it. If data is per user, you can partition it and place each piece of data close to where each of your users are. If data is global in nature, then you have to replicate it. Replication works in many scenarios, but to be viable, it needs three things. It needs to be affordable, which as we discussed, boils down to CPU efficiency. It needs to be easy to set up and it needs to be easy to use, which things like auto routing helps to realize. And this is the end of my presentation. Thank you so much again for attending. Uh, I'll be around uh, in the chat for a couple of hours still. And if you are in the Bay Area, hit me up. I'm actually today all day around in San Jose uh, uh, having uh, some drinks with the Silla folks. And we will be at the Netlify Connect conference tomorrow in the city. So if you are around, uh, let us know. Uh, I'll love to chat. Thank you again very much uh, and, and have a great rest of your conference.